This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Okay, so good morning. When you're ready, we'll make a start. So the plan today is to... Please. There's a lecture, there's a lecture happening in here. So the plan today is to um, start looking at part three of the no notes, which is where we'll start looking at the analysis of feedback control systems. Uh, before we do that, let me just quickly point out some things from the last lecture. So um, to see how the Bode plot of a function that looks like this when evaluated at s equals j omega for omega ranging from zero to infinity, uh, to understand how it dips down like that, you've just got to look at the size of these vectors, okay? And you, you can work out what the length of that is because there's a tri right angle triangle where that is of size psi omega n, that is of size two omega d, okay? So you can work out what that is from uh, Pythagoras, okay? Um, you know what that is, it's psi omega n. When you work it out, you get this expression here for uh, the magnitude at this uh, frequency, okay? So I'll leave it as an exercise for you to work it out, but you can see that it dips down here because this term, okay, is less than one when psi is a number between zero and one, okay? So if we split that log into the sum, of the log of this plus the log of this, you, you'd get this term here for this part plus something negative which brings it down. Okay, so I'll leave it as an exercise for you to work it out. It's just about working out the length of the hypotenuse of a, of a triangle with, a, with a, a, a right angle triangle. Okay, so nothing complicated at all. To become comfortable with these things, you have to do it. You can't just sit there and look at it happening Okay, you have to do it. So try it out, see if you can get that expression there. Uh, I think uh, when I was drawing the phase part of the Bode plot for this example, which we went through in some detail, looking at what each component looks like on the magnitude plot, and then adding each component together to get the overall magnitude plot, and the same on the phase plot, I think here when I drew it, I drew the phase doing something like this, okay, coming down a bit too early, all right? You can see um, that at about this point here, you're getting plus pi on two, plus minus pi on two, they cancel each other out, and so it should be hitting the purple line already at about this frequency, and then it just follows down. So I just wanted to correct that. All right, we had the, the MATLAB generated Bode plot anyway for uh, reference. Um, and then one last thing, when we were looking at uh, problem set two, um, we saw that uh, the analysis of this feedback loop corresponded to looking at these transfer functions T and S, okay? And we saw that T and S had these transfer functions parameterized in terms of the controller transfer function, 
okay? And those parameters were k and tau. We saw that the, uh, the poles of T are shared, uh, are in common with the poles of S. S has an extra pole at S equals minus 3. To look at the stability of the feedback interconnection, we just had to test where the zeros of this polynomial uh, are in the complex plane, and if they lie in the left half plane, then these two transfer functions are stable. And we went through uh, a process of you know, factorising this, reparameterizing it, and testing when uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 had negative real part. Okay, if you got lost in this argument, the other way to look at it is just to say, well, that's just a quadratic. Okay, so we can enclose form right down where the zeros of that quadratic are, right? Using the, you know, the minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a formula. Okay, so if you just write that down for this particular quadratic, you get this expression here. All right? Now, we want these, the zeros of this polynomial, which are the poles of the transfer functions t and s, to lie in the left half plane. So when will they lie in the left half plane? Both of them, right? And there are two because we've got a plus and a minus here. All right? Now, uh, we, we know that the controller parameter tau is positive. All right? So we would like uh, this term here to be positive so that minus this is a negative number. All right? And then if we can make sure that this overall is a negative number, right, then the square root of this plus this will be a number that is either real, okay, if this is still a positive number, but it will be of size less than the square root of 1 minus 3 tau squared, right, because we're taking something away from it, all right? So when we add that to this, we'll still be on the negative real axis in the left half plane. Of course, the one that we take away just puts you further into the left half plane relative to this point here. If this continues to uh, become more and more negative, okay, then you end up with this number being a negative number, and so when you take the square root, you'll get uh, um, two uh, yeah, imaginary points, okay, um, and then the real part is all that matters. Okay, so we get the same conditions as in the analysis over here uh, from looking at this. Right, so there's never one way to skin a cat. You can look at things many different ways. The point of looking at it this way uh, in the lecture last time was because it relates to uh, you know, the uh, coefficient matching technique that we used to factorise uh, or reparameterize polynomials in a previous example. Okay, so it's just one way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it. You could have just looked at it directly this way. All right, so again, practice doing it. Don't just sit here and say, okay, I've seen it done now, I know how it's done. Go away and try it out. Okay, that's how you become comfortable doing these things. All right, so let's start on three. Let me just go backwards a bit. So part three is about continuing on from uh, problem set two. Okay, so in problem set two, that was the first time we did analysis of a feedback control system. And that's all we'll be doing for part three. And then in part four, we'll look at how to design uh, feedback control systems. All right? So we're just continuing on, if you like, from that example we just saw in problem set two. All right, so part three will be about feedback control system analysis. Okay. Uh, today we're going to look at so-called closed-loop sensitivity functions as a way of assessing the performance of feedback control systems. And we'll start thinking about uh, notions of feedback stability, which was precisely what we were doing in problem set two. Okay. Uh, then later on this week, we'll look at methods for assessing the stability of feedback control loops. In particular, we'll look at uh, the Routh technique and root locus. All right, we'll probably get to this stage by the end of the week, maybe the first lecture next week. Then we'll look at problem set three, okay? 
And then the first lecture, the first uh, Tuesday back after the Easter break will be your mid-semester test. And that will cover things up to root locus, or at least the ideas that underpin root locus. All right, so it won't include Nyquist stability analysis because we won't have time to look at that in detail before the test. Okay, so it's up to here, the test. All right, then after the test, we'll look at Nyquist stability analysis. So it's just another technique for analysing the stability of feedback control systems before we start thinking about robustness to model uncertainty, fundamental limits, the internal model principle, and feed forward control. So these are all the pages where you can find uh, these topics in these notes, okay? And there are references to, uh, you know, three different textbooks and the corresponding chapters in them at the bottom. Okay, so these are the references for the Goodwin book, these are the references for Dorf and Bishop, uh, and these are the chapters in Chu and Zhao's book. Okay, you can find this material in lots of other books as well. All right. So what we're looking at is feedback control systems. Feedback control system design involves the application of analysis tools and so-called synthesis tools. What we'll be focusing on now are analysis tools, and these are used to assess performance, okay, for a given controller, and to help us identify trade-offs and fundamental limitations, so that when we're formulating performance specifications, we will not try to do things that are not achievable, or we'll know how to balance things that uh, are conflicting in terms of uh, the performance, uh, corresponding performance specifications. All right. Um, synthesis methods are about how to devise controllers given performance specifications, and that's what we'll be looking at in part four. Okay, probably starting in week nine or so. All right, so part three is really about quantitative analysis of feedback control systems. We've seen an example of that in the last lecture when we were going through problem set two. All right, so we're going to build upon that now. Um, and in particular, we're going to focus on closed loop responses to disturbances and references. So the transfer functions S and T in uh, problem set two were telling us how wiggling inputs to the closed loop caused internal signals to wiggle. All right, so that's the closed loop response to an external input. All right. Uh, then we'll look at closed loop stability, which is also something we looked at in problem set two, um, before moving on to look at robustness issues and structural limitations of feedback. There are limits to what you can achieve with feedback control. All right, and the point of going building up this mathematical toolkit is to help us deal with such things uh, in the design of feedback control systems later on. So this is the general architecture of a feedback control system. We've seen it before. Okay, there's a controller, which sometimes we call a feedback compensator. And why we call it a feedback compensator might become clear depending on where we get to uh, today. All right. Um, there's a, uh, a plant model. Okay. Um, and I would like to, you to think of everything inside the blue dotted box here as being part of the plant model, not just the transfer function, okay? So it includes, uh, you know, disturbances at the output and disturbances at the input. Now these might model uncertainty in the operating environment, okay, as we've seen in various examples before. So if you think right back to the steam engine example, we could think of this as the uncertain load torque that's acting on the system, okay? But if you like, that's part of your model of the plant and its operating environment. And we think of the, these signals as representing uncertainty, something that we don't know exactly. So we didn't know what the torque was, the load torque on the steam engine was, right? We didn't want to have to predict what that was over time and we saw that a feedback loop could help us deal with not knowing what it is while maintaining the speed of the wheel uh, um, close to some nominal value, okay, by having enough gain in the feedback loop, okay? But you can also think of these uh, inputs as allowing you 
to model um, the part uh, relative to a nominal model. And so that's what the little zero subscript denotes here, is that this is the nominal model. All right? And so if your real system is actually different from the nominal model, you could uh, reflect that uh, in lots of different ways. Okay, so we've got our nominal model for how wiggling something that we can, in principle, impose, right, to cause an effect on the thing that we want to control. That's your nominal model, right? Your real system might actually behave more like this, where delta is your modelling uncertainty. Okay? Um, and there are lots of ways to model model uncertainty. So you can model it in an additive way, Right, so that's saying your real system is not just G naught, it's G naught plus delta, some other transfer function. Okay, but you don't know what that delta is. But perhaps you know something about its gain across frequency and not anything about its phase. So the point is that it's not precisely known. You can model uncertainty uh, relative to a nominal model in this multiplicative way. Okay, rather than this additive way up here. And so if, if this is your real system, G, and you've nominally modelled it as G naught, and you have multiplicative uncertainty delta, delta is like the relative uncertainty. Right? If you just uh, use this definition of G and rearrange it, you can figure out what delta is, and you see that it's the relative error between your nominal model and what the system really is. And again, you may not be able to get that exactly but you might be able to put bounds, for example, on how the magnitude of delta changes across frequency, but not, tell, not, not say what the phase does. Okay, so that's why it's uncertain. And you know, here's, here's yet another way that corresponds to an inverse multiplicative uncertainty. All right, so sometimes these signals up here represent uh, the uncertain operating environment and other times they're used in modelling the difference between the nominal model and the real system. Okay? So it's just a flexible framework for the analysis of feedback control systems. Okay? Now, we'll always be working with nominal models of the plant that are real rational transfer functions that are proper. So the ratio of two polynomials, we'll try to stick to the notation B on A, and proper just means that the uh, degree of the polynomial B does not exceed the degree of the polynomial A. All right. Um, the controller transfer function will also be real rational and proper. Okay. We'll often take these polynomials to be what's called co-prime. That just means that there are no common roots, no common factors, right? There's no point in carrying the common factors around because when you divide the two polynomials to form the transfer function, those common factors would just cancel out anyway, right? But um, it turns out to be uh, mathematically useful to also require this co-primeness property, right, in the way that we're describing the transfer functions G and C in terms of the ratio of two polynomials. I'm just trying to introduce some you know, yeah, notation, if you like. Um, so give some things some names so that we can talk about them. All right. Um, so these can be disturbances, okay, corresponding to the operating environment. They can be, help us model uh, uncertainty in the dynamics of the plant. This is used to represent sensor noise, the fact that sensors are not perfect. Okay, so this is what you're measuring, but what the controller sees will be some perturbation away from the actual thing that you're trying to measure. Right? So it's just representing imperfection in the sensor. Okay? The reference is an input to the control system that we impose. Okay? And we use it to command the closed loop, if you like. It's how we specify what we want this to be. All right? which is why we compare it to a measurement of this okay, and take the difference to generate an error signal that the compensator processes to take corrective action. Right? 
hopefully to steer the plant towards an output that is consistent with our reference input. Okay, so that's the general structure of the feedback control system. We've seen it uh, before. Okay, we can understand the performance of the feedback control system by asking how does wiggling this cause this signal to wiggle? How does it cause this signal to wiggle? How does it cause this signal to wiggle? And the same for all of the other inputs to the closed loop. Right, so just like in problem set two, right, we will think of the performance of the closed loop in terms of the transfer functions from external signals like this to internal signals like this and this and this. All right? And we'll call those so-called, we'll call them closed loop sensitivities. It's telling us how sensitive the internal signals are to wiggling the external inputs. Right? That's why they're called sensitivity transfer functions. Okay? So this slide is just showing how you can uh, figure out what those sensitivity transfer functions are in terms of the controller transfer function and plant tr transfer functions. Okay? So just like we saw in problem set two, you can write down some equations directly from the block diagram. Remember that the block diagram is simply a graphical representation of a set of equations. All right? This equation here is just saying, well, y is equal to d naught plus this signal here. But this signal here, which is this part, is just g naught times this signal here. This signal here is u plus d. All right? So this equation just comes straight off this part of the block diagram. Okay, this is just a graphical representation of this equation. All right? Just like this equation is a graphical representation of this part of the block diagram. All right? It's saying that u is c, the controller transfer function, times the error signal. What's the error signal? Well, the error signal is this stuff here. It's R minus YM. But what, what's YM? YM is just Y plus DM. All right? So we've now got these two equations here, which we can put together in exactly the same way as we did in problem set two. Right? So if I now just substitute U into here, right? what do we get? We get YS is DO, let me just uh, not carry around the S's, otherwise I'll fill up the whole screen with S's. So, while I'm not writing S, all of these things are functions of S. All right, so the first equation is saying Y is equal to DO, the output disturbance, plus GO, the nominal model of the plant. And what I'm going to put in here is C R minus C D M minus y, uh, sorry, c times y, obviously. Okay. All right, so, and then we need to add to that di. So all I've done is substituted the second equation into the first. All right, now if I take all of the terms involving y onto the left-hand side, what do I get? I get 1 plus g naught c times y. And that equals d naught plus g naught c r minus g naught c d m plus g naught d i. Okay. And so I can now express y as 1 on 1 plus g naught c times d naught plus g naught c on 1 plus g naught c times r minus g naught c on 1 plus g naught c dm plus g naught 
on 1 plus G naught C times D I. So I've just done exactly the same thing as we did in problem set 2. Okay. And so you can think of this as the transfer function that tells you how Y responds to wiggling the output disturbance. So in a sense, this transfer function is telling you how sensitive Y is to the output disturbance. This transfer function tells you how Y responds to wiggling R. So it tells you how sensitive Y is to the reference input. This transfer function, which gets multiplied by minus 1, tells you how Y responds to wiggling the sensor noise signal. Okay, so it's telling you how sensitive Y is to sensor noise. And the thing to note there is that this transfer function is the same as this two transfer function, except it's just multiplied by minus 1. So the way in which Y is sensitive to the reference is the same uh, as the way it's sensitive to the measurement noise. And we've already discussed that as a potential design trade-off. Because you want Y to follow R. And you could get Y to follow R by making this transfer function have uh, be equal to 1 at frequencies where the reference has most of its energy. Okay? But you don't want Y to be sensitive to the sensor noise. You want this to have a gain or be equal to 0, ideally, at frequencies where the sensor noise is significant. So one's trying to make this 1 at frequencies where R is significant, and we want to make this same transfer function 0, where this has significant energy. Right? And so the only way we can achieve both objectives is if this has most of its energy over a frequency band that's completely separate from the frequency band where R has all of its energy. If R and the sensor noise have energy in a common frequency band, we can't achieve both objectives. We can't make this zero, uh, sorry, one and zero at the same time. They are the same object. All right? And there's an example of a design trade-off. And we deal with those design trade-offs in practice by ensuring that you know, where we want this to be one is different from where we want it to be zero. And that will only be the case if the sensor noise only becomes significant in a frequency range where the reference doesn't have much energy. Okay? So all of this stuff up here is just writing out each of these transfer functions separately, you know, assuming that all of the other terms, uh, so this one up here, it assumes all that's zero because the inputs are zero. Okay, but it's a linear system, right? So the response to the collection of inputs is just the sum of the responses to the individual inputs, and that's what we're seeing directly from the analysis here. All right? Now, we don't just care about Y. We also care about these other signals. We care about how much control effort will be required in response to wiggling any of these inputs. Why? Because we don't want the control signal to become too big. Because in practice, our actuators won't behave linearly over all possible signals going in. Often, actuators saturate. So you'll ask for something that's bigger than, than the actuator can produce. And we're not modelling that in this linear model of a feedback control system. OK? So we care about more than just the transfer function to Y. We care about the sensitivity of the control signal to wiggling the external inputs. Just like we care about the sensitivity of the error signal. We can understand our tracking uh, requirements in terms of this signal not being sensitive to the uh, reference. Okay, instead of thinking about uh, this transfer function here as being one. 
and sometimes it's more convenient to think in those terms, right, in terms of the error signal rather than Y following R directly. Okay? So the main challenge in control system design is that we're effectively trying to shape these transfer functions across frequency given information about how these signals have their energy distributed across frequency. That's really all we're trying to do. But we only have one degree of freedom. The only thing we get to choose is C. Right? And C appears in all of these transfer functions. We're trying to shape four things with one degree of freedom. Right? And the way we can end up doing that is by requiring these transfer functions to have different shapes at different frequencies depending on what we know about these signals and how their energy is distributed across frequency. All right. So here's just a little example all right, where the plant is just a first order system. It has a pole at S equals minus uh, 100, so it's stable. Okay, and we're just using a constant gain controller. And so already in workshop uh, two, you've been looking at controlling the level in a tank with a constant gain controller. In workshop three, which is the first workshop that deals with the little Lego robot, again, you'll be doing position control, right, by controlling the, uh, the position of the, the, the motors that drive the back wheels. Um, using proportional gain control. All right, so you can do a quite a lot with just proportional gain feedback. Um, we won't see how to use much more complicated things until part four. All right, let's just look at this example. So um, if you work out what the uh, so-called output sensitivity transfer function is that tells you how sensitive this signal is to wiggling this, right, and draw its Bode plot for different values of the controller gain K, right, you'll get the Bode plots shown here, right. And if you look at uh, the uh, complement, so-called complementary sensitivity function, which just tells you how sensitive this output signal is to the reference, Okay, for different values of K, you get these Bode plots in blue. Okay, so you, know, you can work out what those transfer functions are by just substituting in what G naught is. It's that thing there. C is just the gain K. Okay, and so that's what's being shown here. I'm just substituting in this for G naught and K for C and just manipulating some stuff algebraically. All right. You can see that for K larger than 1, this term here is approximately 1. Okay. It goes to 1 when K goes to infinity. But even when K is equal to 1, it's 100 divided by 100 plus 1, which is pretty close to 1. Right, so this part of the complementary sensitivity transfer function will give rise to a component of the uh, magnitude part of the Bode plot that just sits at the 0 dB line or just below it. Okay, then we can look at the component due to this on the denominator. Right, and we, we've seen that because I've normalised this to 1 by taking the factor 1 plus 100K out of the bottom, and that's why that's ended up there, okay, that this will be something that starts at 0 dB, right, it'll kick down at 1 over the so-called time constant, all right, at 20 dB per decade. And you can see that where it kicks down is a function of K. As we increase K, this point gets pushed further to the right, okay. So you know you can you can uh, you should be able to do that sort of analysis to figure out why these things have this shape, right? We know that the phase you know the closed loop complementary sensitivity function is also just a first order system. We know that the phase part of a Bode plot will just be something that starts at zero degrees 
and it'll go to minus, pi, so minus 90 degrees. So start at zero radians and go to minus pi and two radians as frequency increases, which is what we're seeing uh, in here. All right? So how do we interpret this? Well, let's think of it in terms of how this signal is sensitive to the reference. So we want this signal to follow the reference. And what this is telling us is that up to about this frequency here, the transfer function from here to here, when evaluated on, you know, on the J omega axis up to a frequency about here, the transfer function is just one because the gain is zero dB and the phase is zero. Right? So it's got magnitude one and phase zero. That's the number one. So to get y, I'm multiplying r by one over this frequency range. In other words, y is following r over that frequency range. As we increase k, we extend the range of frequencies that the output can track. Okay? It extends the range of frequencies over which the gain is one and the range of frequencies over which the phase is zero. So that multiplying r by that transfer function evaluated along the J omega axis is just multiplying by one. In other words, y is following r. It's like r. But uh, at these frequencies here, we're not, going, we're not multiplying by one. We're multiplying by something that is a fraction of one. Right? And it's getting shifted in phase. So for references of high frequency, the, the closed loop does not track them very well. Okay? But, it, but this is also the transfer function from here to here. And if we say that the sensor noise is most significant at high frequency, then this is ensuring that Y is not sensitive to the sensor noise because it's attenuating it. Right? At minus 20 dB, that's multiplying by 0.1. Minus 40 dB is multiplying by 0 0.01. And we can see that increasing, uh, decreasing K reduces the sensitivity of the output signal to sensor noise. Right? So increasing K made the tracking better over a wider range of frequencies, but it also increases the sensitivity to sensor noise at high frequency. Okay, there's an example of a trade-off. All right. Uh, this transfer function is telling you how Y is sensitive to DO, the output disturbance. Okay, and again, you can see that uh, increasing K reduces the sensitivity of the output signal to low frequency output disturbances. As we increase K, the, the gain of the transfer function from here to here decreases, okay? And that's probably what we want if this is a disturbance that we want to reject in the sense that we want Y to follow R no matter how this is wiggling as long as it's a low frequency wiggle, okay? Whereas at high frequencies, uh, this signal will be sensitive to this signal here. So if our output disturbance is uh, um, high frequency, then it will appear in the output signal. All right? But increasing K will extend the range over which uh, the transfer function from here to here attenuates. In other words, multiplies by a number less than one. Okay? Um, you should notice that this plus this is always equal to one. I cannot shape these red and blue curves independently. Right? They always sum to one. Okay? That's another thing to be wary of. I'd encourage you to go through this sort of analysis for this transfer function to verify that these are the right shapes. Again, you learn by doing stuff, not by just sitting here and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. All right, you got to do it. Okay, so that's just thinking entirely in the frequency domain, right? 
This is showing how the step response behaves okay, for different values of k. All right. So you can see that uh, so the blue curves here are the uh, step response from R to Y. Right? And you see as increasing K, we get less distortion in the response to a step change in the reference, which is consistent with the bandwidth of this filter increasing. Right? As we push the roll-off frequency further to the right, we're allowing more of the reference to get through and we get less distortion, right? Y follows the step change at the reference input more quickly. All right? And this is showing what the step response uh, of Y is to a step at the output disturbance. So I put a step in here, you see that Y jumps up to one straight away, right? And for small values of K, it takes quite some time for, uh, you know, it to decay back to zero, assuming the reference is set at zero. Okay. But as we increase K, it rejects the disturbance faster. And that's the same as saying, well, we're blocking more of the reference as we extend the range of frequencies over which the red line has low gain. Okay. So it seems like in this case, increasing the gain is a useful thing to do. It's always giving us a better response. Okay? This is not always the case. All right? It's giving us a faster response, right? Because the shape of these things is such that we get less distortion, if you like, or we block more of the input. Here's another example where the only thing that's been changed is that we're now saying the plant has an integrator in it as well. So in addition to the pole at s equals minus 100, it's got a pole at s equals zero. Okay? And so we can do the same sort of analysis, right? This transfer function tells me how this signal is sensitive to this signal here. This transfer function tells me how sensitive this signal is to this signal here. This transfer function tells me how sensitive this signal is to this as well. Okay? Now you can see that as we change the uh, controller gain K, again, the, the range of frequencies over which this is close to one, which is what we want for the, ref for the output to follow the reference, goes to the right. Okay? But now instead of just extending to the right without any change in the magnitude, what happens here is that it starts popping up. And that's going to give rise to distortion in the output response when we put a step change in here because we're not just passing it through with a gain of one over this range of frequencies we might be amplifying it right and you, and you would expect to see some maybe oscillations in the transient part of the step response okay um, and, and, and it arises because now with this extra pole in the plant the closed loop transfer function will no longer just be a first order system. It won't just have one pole, it has two poles. And as we increase k, right, those poles become a complex conjugate pair. Right? And we know that when we have poles uh, with imaginary, non-zero imaginary part, there will be components of the impulse response, which can be linked to the step response, uh, that will oscillate. Okay? They will remain stable. Uh, but they oscillate. So you've just got to be wary of this. Increasing the gain is not always the right thing to do. Once we increase the gain beyond a certain amount here, we may end up with more oscillations in the step response because of this amplification of frequencies in a particular range. And sure enough, you can observe that in the step responses. Okay. So as we increase k, so this is a small value of k, 0.1, as we increase k, we can see we get faster transients, right? So here it takes a long time for the transient to decay, 
when k equals 1, it takes less time for the transient to decay. It's decayed here already, whereas this one doesn't, the transient part hasn't decayed until about here. Right? But we've paid a small price, so we get some overshoot now, whereas here we didn't have any. And as we continue to increase k, the rise time gets faster, but it oscillates more in the transient, okay, without changing the amount of time it takes to settle. So increasing k from 1 to 25 isn't really beneficial. Right? It hasn't led to a faster transient. It's only led to more oscillations in the transient. Okay? So you've got to be aware of those sorts of things. Intuitively, increasing the controller gain will make things faster. Right? Like increasing it from 0.1 to 1 makes it faster. It takes less time when k equals 1 for the transient part of the response to decay to 0, leaving only the step out. All right? But beyond that, you get no faster and something that's not desirable. Lots of oscillations in the transit. Maybe, it, maybe it's not desirable. It depends on the situation. But you're not getting the speed up that you got in going from here to here. Okay? Because while you know, the, 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 the frequency uh, at which it starts to roll off has been pushed to the right, in doing so, you've, you've ended up with these uh, uh, peaks okay, that will amplify components of whatever's gone in over that frequency range. And we've seen, for example, that a step will have its energy distributed across frequency like a sync function, right? If we turn it off after a certain amount of time, right? So if we put it a pulse, right? And the longer the pulse, the narrower the sync function, the narrower the range of frequencies around zero where most of the energy occurs. But there's always a little bit of energy in a step or a pulse uh, at, at, at higher frequencies. And those components get amplified to give rise to these wiggles in the transient part of the response. Okay. So this is now just looking at, well, you know, what are the transfer functions from these external signals to Y? That's what we worked out before, except we've put a filter in front of the reference to give us another degree of freedom. Okay. Um, you know, remember, we're trying to make these things have the right shape across frequency, given information about how these signals have their energy distributed across frequency. We've only got one degree of freedom here. By putting this filter in, we get another degree of freedom. But it only helps us with the transfer function from the reference to any of the eternal signals. It doesn't help us with the shaping of any of these. Okay? And so this is sometimes called feed-forward control. And what you do is you design the controller, get a closed loop model, and use this to invert the closed loop response over whatever frequency uh, uh, the reference is significant. All right, this is just showing you what the transfer functions from these external signals is to the control input. That's something that you also care about. Now, in reading a lot of textbooks, you might be tempted to think that control system design is all about making the output follow the reference. Well, it's not just about that. You've got to care about all of the sensitivity transfer functions, right? Um, not just how the output follows the reference. Okay, we'll always be thinking about all of these transfer functions. And there's not that many of them, okay? There are only four. Right? There's this one, the so-called complementary sensitivity function. It tells you how the output is sensitive to measurement noise. It tells you this part of how the output is sensitive to the reference. All right? There's the so-called output sensitivity function. It's telling you how this is sensitive to this. There's the input sensitivity function. It's telling you how sensitive this signal is to the input disturbance. And there's the control sensitivity function, which is telling you how this signal is sensitive uh, to the reference. And sensor noise, okay, it's that bit there. 
it's telling you how it's sensitive to the output disturbance. All of these things enter the loop in the same way from the perspective of this signal. All right, so there's only four that you have to worry about. And what's challenging is that if we don't have that reference pre-filter H, we're trying to make these things have the right shape across frequency with only one degree of freedom, that is C. Okay? Um, and, and what makes control design interesting and challenging is the fact that these objects are algebraically related. I've already mentioned that the output sensitivity plus the complementary sensitivity and the little zeros here are just denoting that these are the transfer functions uh, for the nominal model of the plant. Okay? It always sums to one. Right? The uh, input disturbance sensitivity is related to the output dis disturbance sensitivity via multiplication by the plant transfer function, and so on. So you can't shape these things independently. Right? So you've got to, in some sense, separate competing objectives across frequency and hope that you can do that. So if we go back to the example of saying, well, you know, this is sensitive to this and this in the same way, right? And if this has significant energy where the reference has significant energy, then you're not going to be able to get good tracking, right? So what do you have to do? You've got to go and buy a new sensor, right? Such that the sensor noise no longer overlaps in terms of where its energy is across frequency with where the reference has energy across frequency. That's an example of separating competing objectives across frequency so that you can deal with them separately. Okay? So uh, we'll leave it there today. And uh, on Thursday, we'll start with this little example of a design trade off. Hang on, maybe it's in here. No. That's not good. Where did it go? Uh, no, that's another. Uh, that's not good. It just deleted itself for no good reason. Is that possible? I don't know. It's changed it into this, but then there's nothing in there. How did that happen? That's bad. <laughs> Where's it gone? It's like it's really gone. It's somehow that wasn't there before, and now it's there. There's just nothing there like it's deleted it and turned it into that.
strange as food. <sighs> There's nothing is there. Oh, this part, this part. No, but that was from that was from the other year. It's not it's not the same. Um, this is from it's not the same. I didn't do all the same things. It's not the same. It's a different example. It's not the same.